All right. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning, based on where which part of the world you are at. And uh, let's get started with um, a quick recap of what we have done so far. So how's everyone doing, by the way? So I see Abhishek, uh, Sisitha, Arasan, Atul, Heman, Praful, Tulsi, Vinamra. All right. So welcome, everyone. And welcome to this uh, CloudOps cohort sort of challenge, CloudOps challenge that we are doing here. And um, let me just recap what we have done so far and uh, what are we going to do uh, today. Uh, we will get started with that agenda. So we're building a use case where uh, we want to deploy a microservices application on top of cloud. And uh, this is where we are going to deal with a lot of cloud related concepts. We're going to implement things on top of AWS cloud. That is what we are doing right now. And uh, this is the application that we are working with. This is the front end, uh, the catalog voting recommendation. This is the microservices application stack with some backing services such as databases with catalog and uh, vote and uh, so on, right? And while we are building it on cloud, cloud, we are learning about the cloud. Uh, how do you create a scalable, high available, secure, uh, infrastructure and uh, how do you scale it, automate it, and we'll bring in the aspects of DevOps, Linux, cloud. That is what we are working on uh, here. So, so far we have built and designed a secure network with VPC. That's what we did in the mission number one, the week number one. Uh, then we went on to talk about how do we deploy, uh, create a EC2 instance, deploy a front-end microservice. That is a Node.js application that we have deployed already uh, I already have that application running, which I can uh, show you uh, in a minute. And now uh, we bring in some backing services here, starting with, let's say, the catalog application. That is what I'm going to demonstrate to you, if possible, along with the database as well. That is something I'm working on right now. I'll show you what I'm working on and I'll show you where it is kind of stuck a little bit right now. But uh, that is the idea of uh, building this use case. And we'll also look at some network security, Linux uh, related concepts while we are building this use case. All right. So um, any questions, anything uh, from your side? I think Praful, you had, uh, um, you wanted to ask something or should we, you know, if you want to connect <laughs> it back later also, that's fine. All right. Uh, never mind. So uh, we'll get started. I'll get started building and explaining things to you. And uh, later on, we'll take the questions as well. And uh, um, if you want to stay back, you can and ask more questions also after the session. So this is where we stand right now in terms of our use case. We started building a virtual private cloud, a secure network. So we did that by creating a virtual private cloud or a VPC. We talked about AWS's region, global network regions and availability zones, et cetera. So we have created a VPC in one region that is Northern California, and we have created four different subnets uh, so that we can cater or create public and private infrastructure, such as the front-end web application that we set up last time uh, was in the public subnet and then backing services that we can create like databases today, which would be as part of the private subnet. Also, we want to leverage the multi data center, high available infrastructure that AWS gives us in the form of availability zones like AZB, AZC. And uh, then we will start uh, uh, connecting or deploying stuff in different availability zones, talk about auto scaling and stuff like that as well. And this is where we are at. Last week, we talked about how do we set up uh, uh, the web application, the front-end web application on top of EC2. I'm just going to request all of you to be on mute. Okay. All right. So unless, uh, if you have questions, you can unmute and speak for sure. Uh, but otherwise, let's not disturb uh, the class. Okay, so we have web application, which is deployed here. Now we'll set up another application, let's say catalog service. Now the catalog service, as we talked about last week, it can be here. 
maybe on the same server as well, or you can set up a infra, I mean, a server in private subnet as well. And the only challenge with that, as far as the application is concerned, our front end is capable of doing server side rendering, meaning all the requests from the users go via the front end application. And that can connect to the backing services like catalog, and uh, uh, we're talking about this microservice. So catalog voting recommendation can possibly in the private subnets. Um, the only challenge there would be for our setup, this kind of a lab, small lab setup is how do we get to the internet from here, right? And fetch the packages, install those packages and uh, those kind of things, right? Now that can be solved by creating a NAT instance in the public subnet. However, that could incur, uh, that is that means you're launching another EC2 instance and that can incur additional cost or your credits like free tier credits also. So I'm trying to avoid that and see if we can either use this instance as NAT instance also that is possible. I was trying to get that to work. There were some challenges, so I've stopped it there, uh, but probably next week I'll show you this because if I can show you this, there are a lot of different concepts we can cover like uh, SSH multi-hop uh, connections in, re in real life, how it works, uh, using IP table configurations here, uh, you know, packet forwarding and what are the configurations that you have to do for that. Uh, how do you set up the route tables for the private subnets? So if that works and I'm experimenting with it right now, it does work. I need to just sit down and uh, figure out and do some troubleshooting there. But eventually what we want to do is move these instances to private subnet, use this as a NAT instance, and then route via this for the internet activity. That's possible. It's just that it's taking a little longer. So what I'm doing right now, when I demonstrate today is launch another EC2 instance and run that to uh, serve as a catalog service. Catalog service is a Python application. Now this can connect to the built-in database right here, or later on, you can move it to the backing database, which is running on a MySQL. So if you look at the architecture diagram, there's some change there. There's one change there. Let me show you which one. So if you look at my architecture diagram here for this microservices uh, application, the catalog uh, says catalog DB is Mongo, but this is actually a relational database. The good candidate for the database here is relational database because we may have relational tables which can connect to each other and all that and reference each other. Uh, and for that catalog, um, a good choice would be MySQL for voting application, which is like unstructured data and uh, stuff. So that can be hosted with uh, something like uh, MongoDB. So there's gonna be switch between this and this would use uh, uh, you know a MySQL or a Postgres. I think it's a it's been configured with the Postgres. So uh, that is what we are going to try and achieve here. Uh, so the database backend for the application server is going to be a Postgres database. Yeah, uh, we'll configure that later. For now, what I'm going to do is create a catalog service, host it in the public subnet for the time being, and uh, then have the front end server connect to the catalog service as well. That's what I'm going to try and show you. And again, we'll use EC2 here. Later on, we will configure the database and we'll see how that works as well. Eventually, um, this is still evolving. This is a use case that we are building. If you look at my missions, uh, this is still going to evolve because I would love to bring in uh, some advanced configurations like setting up NAT here, uh, using multi-hop SSH here then uh, using or configuring Nginx on top of it. We can always use load balancer, but using Nginx is a good idea because uh, that is used widely used in a lot of organizations. And as a DevOps professional or a DevOps practitioner, 
having a knowledge of configuring nginx for you know using that as a uh, reverse proxy basically it will serve like this there will be front end application there will be catalog services there would be uh, voting application there is a recommendation service and you can set up nginx or equivalent on top of this which acts like a reverse proxy for all of these services it can be done as well so i'm thinking of bringing these kind of modules i am experimenting with it whatever i can make it work i will have you try it as well or uh, let you try that as a project as well so i need to first figure out uh, the feasibility and how it works and stuff like that that's that's the part i'm kind of uh, working on so this use case will evolve as we go along every week and uh, we are doing seven missions here and we'll bring in mostly auto scaling component, uh, some scripting component, and uh, maybe Azure component as well, if possible. I'm thinking of uh, all of those as possibilities uh, for our project here that we're building. So right now, I'll just show you how to deploy this catalog service. Initially, uh, it's a Python application, so it will be similar to launching an EC2 instance in a public subnet, deploying the Python application this time instead of, uh, uh, let's say, instead of let's say uh, a Node.js application that we used last time, this is gonna be a Python application. And then once that is deployed, uh, I would also show you by connecting it with the database backend here with uh, maybe Postgres. That is something uh, we'll see if it works, uh, it's great. If not, I'll show you uh, in the next week's uh, session here. So where is my cloud infrastructure? Let me connect to that and start deploying the uh, second instance here. Uh, well, I can also configure it on the same server as frontend, but um, I would keep that to run my frontend Node.js and maybe possibly Nginx later, and then uh, create a new instance right now. But it will look like same set of steps that I demonstrated in the last week. So this instance gets created in the public subnet. Same domain in terms of the scope and how it is going to work. It will be in a public subnet, uh, just a different service. So different security group for that as well. And uh, that is what, uh, you know, I'm going to launch here. So this gets launched as a, let's call it as a catalog. Yeah. And I launch it with Ubuntu. So the template or the AMI, as it is called in the world of AWS, is uh, Ubuntu here. Uh, T2 micro instance, the key pair is same as earlier. So I've already created the SSH key pair. I've demonstrated to you how to create key pairs, security groups, etc. So I've chosen the existing key pair. Uh, network wise, I'll have to choose the VPC with the public subnet. So the same VPC where everything else is, like the front end application, it's the same VPC. And one of the public subnet is what I'm going to choose. The same VPC that was created for our project craft tester. And one of the public subnets, not the private subnet, any public subnet would do. I'll choose PubSub2 this time. Public IP, I want it to be enabled right now, right? Because I want to connect to it and install stuff on it as well, right? So firewall wise, I want it to have uh, a new security group for the catalog service. Every type of service that you create should have its own security group actually. And this is a Python application. So I'll just add that into description. SSH I'll open for everyone. And one more port that I need to open is for the application depending on the application, let's say if we look at this source code, it has the services and the code for it in along with the instructions, how to install and stuff. And uh, in this case, the application will come upon port number 5,000. So if I want to access it from outside, I want it to be open, that port. So port number 5,000 is a custom port. And I'll say, open it from anywhere for now. SSH should be open, at least for me or anywhere. Uh, so I can pick my IP as well, or just stick to anywhere.
All right, this rule is there already, 5,000 that we need. Uh, nothing else that I want to configure as of now. I'll launch the instance and configure everything else later. So last week I'd shown you how to set up the Node.js application. This time I'm going to do the same for the Python app. So we'll just wait for this to come up and uh, then demonstrate uh, the actual configuration of installing Python, deploying that application and creating the services. All right. If there are any questions in the meanwhile, I can uh, take those as well. I'm also just bringing up the instructions to install Python on Ubuntu. Now that you can just look up over the internet as well. All right, this instance should be ready in a minute or so. And then I'll install the Python application on top of that. By the way, I've updated or uploaded the recordings to the portal as CloudOps Cloud uh, cohort. And uh, last two sessions along with some reference lab material is there. It's not supposed to be a solution like everything step-by-step -step that you can follow because this is more like a project that you want to build and I want you to spend some time building that uh, as a project. If there is anything missing, you can uh, you know, reach out to me, but uh, you are supposed to implement it yourself as well. So this is the catalog service, which is now running. I'll connect to that and then start setting up uh, Python on top of that first. So when I SSH, I'll have to use my key pair. The same key pair that uh, I am using to launch the instance with and uh, the IP address of that, uh, which brings me inside that server. Start by just updating the repository. This is Ubuntu 24.04, the latest version of Ubuntu. Gonna bring my notes uh, here to set up Python on top of Ubuntu, really. So uh, I will install one repository. This is a repository which has the latest version of Python, but you can look up the instruction to install Python. It can be also a slightly older version is fine. Whichever is available in the repository, that's also fine. If you want to stick to that. Now, what this is trying to do now is just update the package report cache. And then I would go ahead and install uh, the application. So these are some prerequisite for installing Python. That is what is happening right now. Now this can be very straightforward, this uh, set of instructions to install Python and pip uh, you should be able to find it anyways, anywhere. And this is using a package manager that we have uh, with Ubuntu, which is apt. So you can use apt install, apt get install, either of that would work. All right, this is going to take a few minutes to set it up and then now uh, we should be able to start uh, installing or deploying the Python application. So if you look at this repository, I'll share the source code uh, repository also. So this is the application that you're supposed to deploy. And if you look at that application, it has uh, instructions on building each of this component like catalog service. How do you build it? 
once you have the Python, you need to have Python and pip installed. Pip is a package manager for Python. Just like how APT is a package manager for Ubuntu, Yum is a package manager for Red Hat. Uh, you have Python package manager, which is pip. And you use pip to install all the dependencies, the packages and its dependencies. So these are the packages you're going to need. This application is built with a Python framework called as Flask and uses a web server called as Unicorn. And then it needs some other dependencies. For example, to connect to the database, it needs those dependencies. And uh, that is what it is talking about here. So you see it um, installs all those dependencies when you run this command. And then it will launch the application on port number 5000 if you run it this way. So currently it is just installing the dependencies for me, uh, all the build tools and dependencies. Once that is done, I'll start deploying or installing Python. Okay, that was just installation of dependencies. Python is yet to be installed. So I'm adding a repository. It's a it's called as a PP or a private package archive, right? So you can create your own PPS as well or private packages uh, as well. Uh, you can alternately install it directly from the repositories which come with Ubuntu. That is also, uh, that would work actually. This just gives me a latest version of Python, which is not available in the, may not be available in the repository. But you can stick to the one in the repository, even if it is slightly older version that would, uh, that could work too. And once this is installed with uh, uh, the Python and pip3, is what I'll install. And then uh, I'll start deploying the application itself. So currently the front-end application that is there looks like this. The front-end application is just a kind of a scaffold uh, which connects with the backend services. It needs backing services in order for it to work properly. So this is the front-end application right now, running on port 3000. Now, this is a microservices application stack. It has been designed in a way that even if no backing services are there, just the front-end can stand on its own. That is why you see a very bare minimum framework kind of an application, but it's there. And if you look at this on the right-hand side, uh, this application is designed, I've created this application in a way that uh, it's a good learning application. You exactly know the status of what is the backing service, which is up and down. Uh, currently, it's not able to connect to voting or recommendation engine. Even the catalog service is down. I've just configured a few things there. So that's why it doesn't show up there. But uh, that's why nothing shows up here. But the moment catalog service will be up, you will see uh, it in green status on the right. And you'll also see the actual catalog loading. We'll see that in a few minutes. So install Python and then uh, Python pip also. So after setting up uh, Python and Python pip, I'm just updating the configuration. I would be updating the configuration to set that whatever is available as default on the system so that it can use that whenever I run Python or pip, uh, it would just reference that, uh, you know, whatever is installed currently. So 
this is a micro instance. So it takes a bit time, bit of a time to deploy anything. Uh, but that's all right for us, considering this being a kind of a small demo environment. And uh, now that I have Python installed, I will deploy the uh, catalog service also. Hauser will be uh, with this application code itself. So let me first build it and show you. Then we can also demonize it, set it up as a systemd service as well, like we like I demonstrated earlier with uh, the front end application. So this is where I clone the app, the code, go in there. And this is the catalog service. So catalog service, how do we build it is uh, uh, the instructions are given here. You have to use Python pip, the package installer and install it this way and just launch the application this way. That's all really it. To start that service, that is to build the service. This is the, this is the command. What it does is it reads the requirements file, the packages and its dependencies and it installs the entire dependency chain, whatever is needed to run that application, install those, you know, packages, its dependencies, it basically uh, runs all of that or installs everything that is needed. And then you can launch the application this way, Unicorn app colon app, because this is built with Python Flask. And there is a Python based web server called as Unicorn. And this is how you launch the service and bind it on port number 5000 on the same server. And now that it's running on port 5000, my security group is already open. If you look at the instances here and the instance running catalog service has the security group port open already for a 5000 port, which you can see here. Since it is open for all, I can access this application using the public IP of this server. There you go. So this is the backing service. This is the catalog service. And uh, this is what the front end would eventually connect with. So if you look at the architecture, the application architecture, microservices architecture. This is an independent service. The catalog is what is going to give you the uh, product and the images. This is like an e-commerce application itself. So the front end application, there is a catalog, which is this service that I've just launched. And that brings you the catalog, the product catalog. And you can also see this is the API front end and the actual API calls can be made this way. You see, if you want to list all the products, you can use get command on this product uh, service. Yeah, to list all the products, or you can list one specific product by using its kind of a API call for specifically for that product. Like you can use API slash product slash one, something like that, right? So if you say if you API products, it shows you all, but you can also individually list the products using some API calls there. Now, this is the product service, the API service. I want to connect my front end to the product catalog service. And for that, I'll have to go to front end's configuration because right now, this is not happening. This is the front end. It's not connecting to the catalog service yet. You see catalog is down. You saw that red uh, button here. I just refreshed it. That's why it's gone away. Uh, that's because it's not able to connect to the backend service. How do we make that happen is going to be the configuration file for the front end application. So I'll go to the front end and uh, make that happen. So this is where the application configuration is for the front end. And this service is using system CTL.
yeah, system CTL script that I've demonstrated to you. How do you make this as a daemon? Uh, have it start automatically with system D at the boot time. For that, you just have to add a script to uh, one of this configuration files like ATC system D and some service configuration like this, where you have how to start the service and all that, that command is there. Now, if you look at the front end, the configuration for that is here, config.json. This is where it is trying to connect to the backing services, all the backing services, including the catalog recommendation. This is the recommendation service. This is the voting service. This is the products API base URL is for the catalog service. So this has to be updated to the IP address or the host name of the catalog service itself. And this can be internal IP also, meaning we have VPC, we have uh, uh, EC2 instance. This has external facing IP, which is its public IP, and it has an internal IP also. For communication between one EC2 instance and one server and another server in the cloud within the same network, you can use the private IP also. That's what I'm going to use here. I can also test it by running a curl command or equivalent. So from the front end, can I reach out to catalog service or not? That's what I'm checking and I can. And then I can also say API products and load the products, right? Or API products and uh, the first product, right? So something like that, you know, you can call it that way as well, based on what is the API uh, call that is allowed. And you can, uh, if this is working, um, what that means is I'll have to just refresh the configuration once. So I'll use system CTL restart of the craft stuff, front end service, basically. Check the status, make sure it is up and running. And now if I go back to the front end application and reload it, it's not showing the catalog yet, right? So you see the catalog service was down. I've added that configuration for it to connect to the catalog and now it is up. This is the exact, you know, this is a good example of uh, resilient microservices where if the service was is working, it shows up the content. If it is not working, it just doesn't show that box, right? It just says it's not able to connect. I mean, I have that added as a debug statement. So you can see that recommendation engines is not available. So it doesn't show that, uh, that component. There is a component which will show up whenever the recommendation engine comes up, which is a Golang application. It shows up one more box there. It's not showing that because uh, that service is not available. You can see that the status chart is on the right hand side. Again, that is a feature that I've added to this application so that you know which services are up, which services are not. And based on that, you will you expect to see the information. Like it shows up the product catalog, but not the votes or reviews and not the recommendation, which is the auto-generated recommendation uh, origami of the day, uh, which doesn't show up yet. But that's about the building a resilient kind of a application, which shows you the components based on what is available at that point of time. And what we've been able to do is set up the catalog service and connect to that from the front-end application. Now the catalog service that is created here uh, is not yet connected to the database. That's what I really want to do next. And the way it has been configured is quite interesting. I'll show you that. So if you look at the catalog service, by default, it uses a JSON file based catalog, which you might see somewhere here. So there is a products JSON file. So it is loading it from here, this API server. Right, that's the default configuration. And that's why you see there's a config.json file here. The data source is set to JSON. If it is set to JSON, it will read it from that file. But you can also switch it to the database. How? By setting the config.json to DB. But for that, you also need to have a backing database available. Uh, I'll talk about that. And uh, then if that is available, then it uses that configuration 
the data source configuration as DB. And then it starts connecting to DB and then it will possibly uh, load the application from the database and uh, so on and so forth, right? Now that is what uh, you may see happen once the database is available actually, yeah? Now for that, I need to create the DB and then also load the products into the database also, right? So this is the code which is going to load the products into the DB once the database is available actually, right? So that's the next part of it. So this part is something I'm still kind of working on because um, I have launched, I had launched the database. I was not able to connect to it. I was trying to debug this, but I'll explain the concepts and at least show you by launching the database, the configuration, we can come back and look at it later also. So where should the database exist in the first place? This is the catalog service running in the public subnet. Uh, the ideal place to keep the database would be the private subnet here. And how should we launch the database is where we can either launch an EC2 instance, configure everything on top of that, or use a managed service from um, AWS. What is the name of the managed service? Does anyone know? You can put it in the chat. For the databases, relational databases, which is the managed service. It is called as RDS, that's right. And why would you want to use RDS is because with databases, there's a lot of overhead of administering it. For example, if you want to create a high available setup, it's something that like you will have to set up uh, replication. You have your primary server, you have a standby and you'll have to keep on replicating it. Replication also is not like permanent. You have to keep monitoring the replication, see if it works or not. Uh, you have to patch the databases. You may have to set up the read replicas for scaling up the reads. You may want to launch multiples of read replicas of the database as well and uh, so on. So if you want to achieve this high availability, scalability, if you want the failover to happen automatically, if this goes down, this should take over and vice versa. So if you want that to happen, uh, there is a lot of overhead which is involved in deploying, configuring, optimizing, and managing the database, its performance, and so on. And that's what is automatically taken care of by AWS if you use a managed service for the relational databases, which is called as RDS. And it supports five or six different databases, five databases including MySQL, Postgres, uh, SQL Server, Oracle DB2, and uh, Oracle DB, and there is a IBM DB2, right? So for well, five or six services it supports, the, the recent one being IBM, uh, IBM's DB2, I believe. Now, how do you go about creating that database uh, is what I will demonstrate to you. And uh, for that, there is this RDS as a service here, the relational database service. And here you can see, you can create the database and it will uh, show you all the options. AWS also has its own optimized version of MySQL called as Aurora. It has optimized version for MySQL and PostgreSQL, both actually. So there is a PostgreSQL Aurora, MySQL Aurora. Uh, there is a MariaDB, which is also a spin off of MySQL, actually just a fork of MySQL. There is Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, IBM DB2. So those are the five databases, mainly MySQL and its variants, Postgres and its variants. Oracle database, SQL Server, IBM DB2. Those are the five database engines which are supported right now. Now, when you launch the database, you also need to have some configurations in place. Like you need to define the scope saying that the database should be run in only the private subnets. How do you define that scope is by creating something called as a DB subnet group. And then you launch the actual database and then you connect from your application server and uh, provide that configuration there. So that we will look at step by step. So what I want to show you is by demonstrating how to launch this database that we are going to connect to from the catalog front end service.
So the catalog service will use this configuration. Like this is my database host. This is the database name called as catalog. This is the user I want, some password I would want to connect with. And uh, that is what you'll also configure while launching the database itself. So before I create the database, I will create a subnet group first. For my application, Craftista catalog. So actually Craftista DB uh, can be, or a subnet group, it's good enough. Yeah, and I'll choose the VPC. And uh, subnets, just the private subnets. So I know my uh, subnets, right, by CIDR blocks. So these smaller subnets, slash 26 subnets are my private subnets. So I'm creating a scope to define when you launch the database, its replicas stick to only these subnets. That's what I'm defining with the subnet group here. And now I'm, I can create my database here. So I'll select uh, PostgreSQL because our application uses Postgres as a backend, right? That's part of the application configuration. So we'll stick to whatever the latest version is. We'll use the free tier. If you choose production or dev test, what happens is it creates a large server and it creates something called as a multi-AZ setup. That's a scalable feature, meaning there will be a primary running in one data center or one availability zone. And then there is a secondary, this is like a hot standby running in a different data center. So if primary goes down, this will take over automatically. And that's the setup that comes with if you choose production template, right? That's why we don't want it. Dev test creates one instance, but large. Free tier will stick to like small instance. And if you want to use free tier account, don't want to use any additional, uh, want to spend any additional on the infrastructure, stick to free tier. This is where I'll say catalog DB. Username is, uh, I'll call it as DevOps as the username. Provide my password. It's a weak password, I know that for now. Uh, Self-managed is what we will say. The secret is fine. Uh, T3 micro, this is what I'm talking about. So if you choose anything else, you'll end up creating a large instance and it will go beyond the free tier and uh, you want to avoid that. Storage wise, we can select uh, however much, uh, like minimum is five and it scales. It can scale automatically also. The storage can scale automatically. You can have it configured that way. Connectivity wise, we'll say, um, or don't connect right now and we'll manage it via security group, the uh, access control. And we just want to make sure that it create, it's created in the correct VPC and the subnet group. Now subnet group decides Within the same VPC also, it will not get created here. So we don't want database to be created in here or here. We want it in specific subnets, which are private. And that's why we're defining the subnet groups. We don't want public access for the database. And security group wise, we will create a new one for the Postgres database. Uh, availability zone doesn't matter and uh, database will keep it to password authentication. And we may want to provide the initial database name also. Some database that we want to create or have set up like this catalog because application would connect to some database which is available there. And uh, that's it. I'll just go ahead and create the database. And then I'll have to change things accordingly here. There are a few things that we need to configure in order for this connection to work. One is of course, we'll have to edit the application configuration. This is the catalog service. The host name will show up once my server is ready.
DB name is catalog. DB user is this. Password is whatever I provided. It's that weak password it uh, gave a warning for. That's fine for now. And database host is going to be whatever uh, is created once it is available. So RDS is very straightforward to use. Just create a database, connect to it, and you get started. The only thing now is to connect to it, we'll have to configure the security group for, uh, that's like a firewall for the database. And that can be configured at uh, this level right here. And we want to provide access only from the web server. So how do we keep it very secure is let's say uh, we want to provide access only from this server, not even the web server, the front end server, just the catalog service, right? So how do we ensure or restrict only from a particular uh, service or a particular instance or a particular type of a service because catalog we may have multiple instances for it when we scale it and this is allowed but if there is a front-end application if there is a vote application uh, we don't want this to connect to the database uh, we have to add this rule to the firewall or a security group but on basis of what what can we use to restrict it to only this, this application and nothing else in the VPC? That's a question to you. So Heyman says create firewall rules. Yes, that's what we're going to create those. So we can create the firewall rules using security groups actually. So it will be a security group that we will edit, but uh, access to what? Because if you say VPC, it will be available from everywhere. Anyone can connect, right? Uh, if you have even a address of this network subnet and this subnet, again, all these instances can connect to the same database, right? So how do we restrict this is, uh, uh, Pradeep, you're right. I mean, um, anyone else has figured this out, how to achieve this? So basically we add a rule. Yes, but uh, when we define the rule, we whitelist only a specific thing. I'll show you. So this is the Postgres uh, uh, port. So when I choose Postgres, the port is chosen as 5432. That's what I want. This is what we are talking about. So if I say anywhere, uh, this allows access from anywhere. It, it still is restricted to VPC. We can also provide VPC IP side a block like this. This is, but this gives you access to uh, everything to the database. So how do we restrict it to only specific set of instances, specific classes of servers? So this is where uh, our security group itself comes in handy because this is also the reason why you would want to create different security groups for different types of servers, for catalog, for front-end. Each of this should have its own respective security group, front-end, catalog, right? Everything has its own security group. And that way, what happens is this is attached to a security group called as catalog. Let's call it as C. Uh, or this is attached to front end. This is attached to front end. This is attached to vote. This is attached to catalog. This is attached to catalog. So what we are what we are do, essentially doing is we say that this is okay. Anything which is attached to this particular security group, I'm fine. Apart from that, everything is denied by default. Yeah, that way it is easier to restrict access by uh, or to a particular set of servers only. So that's what we do here. Security group configuration for the database. Uh, let me go back to that. We'll stick to particular security group that is catalog. Only the catalog service can access the database, not even the front end. And that's it. So that adds access to the catalog server. I can also check it. So if you want to do troubleshooting on the level of, uh, you know, network level from Linux here, I will show you how to do that as well. Let me go back to database first. Let's see if the database is ready. It is, and this is the server name. 
this is the instance or a server name so when i connect with the provide the host name it is going to be this this is the host name this is the db name and it will connect over port number 5432 so can i connect from catalog to this database or not do i have a line of sight to that particular database on database application i'm talking about postgres that you can check with something like nmap yeah okay something wrong with here i think the system depends on python and python has been overwritten that's why it has some issues let's hope that this works though yeah so nmap what i do is do a port scanning from the catalog service to the database server and uh, that's when i'll use all the configuration for the database server this is the host name i want to connect to this host on port number 5432 because that's where my postgres is running on I think nmap doesn't need the host name. Just needs the port, but not the host. Uh, minus set option is not needed. Sometimes I have to use this option. And this is open. So if I go to catalog and run this, this is fine. If I go to, this is the front end application on the right. From there, is this available or not? Let's see. Network wise, you can reach out. But if you look at security group, it shouldn't work. Yeah, so any network troubleshooting, this is how you can actually confirm and troubleshoot as well, whether the security group is open for me or not. If I go to catalog, this is open. If I go to Postgres, uh, anything else like front end, it is filtered. Filtered means somebody is blocking that packet. Mostly a firewall or a security group. It can be from source side. It could be from a destination side. In this case, destination is the database. Database is blocking these packets for everyone else except for catalog and maybe whatever the rule you have. I will show you by opening it for front end also. So it's very easy. So you can just go to security group. So just like this, I'll add another rule for Postgres port, only for the Postgres port and say, allow it from the front end also. By selecting the security group, which is associated with the front end instance. If I do that, the right hand side, if I scan the port again, it should be open to me, right? That's how you do the troubleshooting. This nmap command is quite useful for this kind of troubleshooting, right? A lot of times you'll have to see, oh, can I connect to this service from here or not? How do you verify it? Use nmap. That's where uh, this is quite useful. I'm changing that security or removing that security group again because I don't need front end to connect to the database. So that rule, is what I'm going to change again. Gaurav? Yes. See, now uh, we are trying to connect to the uh, database server, but actually not the database, right? Currently, just the database server on port number 5432, not the actual database yet. Right? It's not the database, it's the server on port, particular port. So this is a generic kind of a use case and a troubleshooting. If you want to connect to any application, any server on any particular port, you can use the nmap for that kind of scanning. So right now it's just limited to the server and the particular port. Okay. I'm changing this to remove uh, security group for front end is ending 4C. So this is the rule I want to remove. 
so that I go back to that previous stage where everything except for catalog application, uh, it's blocked. Catalog can connect, anyone else cannot. Right, and now what I need to do next is, this is on, I'm on a catalog server here. So this is where the config file is. Uh, this needs to be updated properly to connect to the database. And then let me check if it is, I'm not sure I have to talk to the developer because I made some changes to this, got some changes made so that this application can connect to the database using this file, but whether it creates the tables in the database automatically or not, that's something I'm not yet sure. So let me check that. So data source, I will change it to DB. You'll see some conditionals here in app.py uh, where if config.get.data, if the data source is set to DB, it is going to try and connect to the DB and try to get the product from there. So does it upload the products or not? Uh, probably not, but I'll just confirm that. And what I'll do is try to use this application uh, launch command again. Yeah. I'll probably have to create the tables first, that's right. So there is a script to do that, dbcreate.py. And uh, let me check this. So this wouldn't work now. Yeah. It shows everything down. That's fine. And uh, this is where my products API is. This works, but it doesn't show the products yet. Yes. And that's expected. So let's see if I can run that directly. So there is a DB create pie. Uh, I think this is using its own connection string here. This probably needs some more update. Post is going to be, so this uses psychopg is a Python module to connect to Postgres. That I can tell you, but let's see if I um, have this code as working as expected or not. And the database is catalog, username is DevOps, password uh, is going to be this. So the job of this script is going to be to create the tables if they are, uh, and Yeah, I think this needs a little bit of a updates. It gives me an error somewhere on line 35 right now. So that is somewhere here. Yeah. Somewhere here. I think it's not thinking it's uh, a complete line or something like that. So I may have to make some changes to this. I'm not doing it right now because this might need multiple iterations of it, but what it's supposed to do is create the database when it is ready. Uh, the script is when the script is working and this should connect to the database server, create the tables, add the products. Now that is what the application is supposed to connect to using config.json. And once that is working, it will go back to the previous configuration. I'm just going to assume that it's working and uh, go back to this kind of a configuration for now. But when that is available, you are going to see exactly same outcome as uh, what you saw earlier. 
just that it would be all coming via the database. That would be Postgres, right? That is the only difference. And uh, um, that's that. So that's how you basically can connect uh, a database to an application server. Uh, I will work on this script and then share the update with you once it is done. But uh, the application, front-end application is connecting to catalog. Catalog is connecting to DB. We selectively configured the catalog service to connect to DB. Nothing else can, right? And uh, this is the kind of configuration that we have so far. Uh, if you want to make it more secure and um, uh, more sophisticated, uh, more a little more um, secure con configuration rather, what you would do is move the catalog service to the backend application as well. So in ideal world kind of a scenario, uh, I would want this to be in the just the front end application to be in the public subnet. And I would create entirely different subnets, like some private subnets for my rest of the services. This is where catalog, this is where uh, recommendation, this is where voting service will reside, these subnets. And databases can have its own uh, private subnets. You can call them as DB subnets. You can typically, you will see the DB subnets to be smaller. And then you have your uh, application, like private applications here. And then the front end application here, right? And then I would want to set up uh, Nginx in the public subnet itself, which would act like a reverse proxy. And then it would also help you connect from here to here. You can also set up some sort of uh, load balancer here so that the front end application connects to the load balancer and then from there connects to the catalog service and uh, so on. You can also have another load balancer here for the front end application if you want, right? So that can also be done. Uh, to create a very scalable uh, configuration. This is like an internal gateway. This is an external gateway. And this can land upon Nginx and come here as well. Uh, so something like this would be a setup that I would want to create. And each of the dish service has its own database, like catalog service, and maybe uh, the voting service has a Mongo database running somewhere, yeah and it connects to that, or maybe in a private subnet, but managed with a different service like Atlas and whatnot, right? So you can have this kind of a configuration created, uh, infrastructure design, so that you can create a high available, uh, high available, if you have multiple instances, multi database in multi AZ setup, scalable, if you have load balancer, that becomes scalable, also very flexible in terms of configurations, and uh, secure because you will have only the front end service exposed to the outside world. Everything else will be in, in a private subnet. And then you can have NAT con gateway here. In fact, this can serve as a NAT gateway as well. And when you connect to these servers, you can use multi-hop SSH configurations and stuff. So that is something we can work towards to make it, or to iterate over this infrastructure and make it a little more secure and um, you know set up the scalability, availability kind of features as well. So that is something we can work towards, right? Um, if possible, I'll try to incorporate as part of this uh, cohort or a uh, challenge that we are doing here. Uh, I just need to test everything and see, uh, make things work that are breaking as well as see everything else, whether that works properly or not so that I can also create the reference material for you that you can use. But are there any questions with respect to this? Because that's all we have for this week. Next, next week, I'm gonna show you by adding more um, applications. And then we'll start working towards either the scalability aspect of it, where we use auto scaling and load balancer um, and some configuration related to that possibly. So that's, Either that or 
maybe in nginx and stuff so whatever um works out we will pick that up and uh, definitely iterate over the existing setup and make it a little better uh, and so on that's the idea any questions anything for this week All right, so in terms of this use case, if you are already a member, you have access to the recordings and uh, reference content. If you're not a member, even you may have access to the YouTube channel where you'll find the recordings. Previous recordings are also there. Uh, reference content though will be available on our portal. That's the announcement. Uh, second thing is uh, I'm working on a course which is uh, ready already on Ergo CD. And it would be about building a entire CI/CD use case with Ergo CD. I'll just briefly explain to you. I've spoken about it in the Thursday call as well, the Thursday community call that we do. And uh, this is the use case that we are going to build. All of these presentations are from that. So it's a microservices application stack, and we build a CI/CD workflow using different tools here. And it starts, the workflow starts like this. So whenever you have a source code update, it triggers the pipeline, the continuous integration pipeline, typically build test package pipeline. It's a container-based delivery. So it creates an uh, image which is published to the container registry. From there, it triggers the deployment. Deployment to staging with blue-green, uh, deployment to prod with canary. And that prod deployment staging to the production promotion happens with, it's a continuous delivery. So there will be someone like a release manager who will, will pull the lever and then it deploys to prod and that we simulate and implement with principles of GitOps. I'll talk about that uh, briefly here. So how do we implement each of this is Ergo workflow is what we use to create this pipeline with the continuous integration pipeline. Ergo even triggers the pipeline based on a source trigger, which is a Git repository uh, being updated here. And then it publishes an image to the registry. From there onward, there is a deployment code repository, which is a separate repository than the source code that triggers the rollout to staging. That's where Argo CD comes in. Argo CD's job is to pick up the code, deployment code from the Git repository and sync it. That's the desired state, sync it with the environment like production here. And then, then we can implement this kind of a lever, manual lever by using pull request model. That's why it is called as GitOps. You can set up Git-based workflows, have two different branches, main and release. Main branch goes to uh, staging automatically. If you raise a pull request from main to release branch, that would trigger a production deployment. And those deployments are implemented by Ergo rollouts. That's when you can add strategies like blue, green, canary. You can also do automated monitoring. This is all integrated with Prometheus. And then based on that, you can run some automated checks and roll out only if the checks pass, analysis passes, and roll back if there is a problem. And then between this and this, how do we connect CI with CD is a tool called as Ergo image updater, which scans your repository, finds a new image, and then updates the code in the Git repository where you have deployment manifest. And it will say like, oh, instead of version X, it's version Y. And then Ergo CD comes in, starts deploying to staging, to prod. So if you want to set up CI CD on Kubernetes, uh, this is a perfect use case for you that you can build with the bootcamp that is going to be available to you from this week onward. It'll be there on our portal, uh, available to the existing members. If you are not, you can be one. Uh, if you are not a member uh, as well, I'm this time I'm going to publish it on Udemy as well at the same time. So it will be available on Udemy as well. It's being uploaded. You can see that here. So this Ultimate Ago Bootcamp uh, will be published on Udemy too. So this is, I'm creating a setup where if you want to just buy one bootcamp, you have an access to that through Udemy. Uh, if you want to buy the entire bundle of boot camps, you can buy it as a subscription or maybe a bundles that we release or the lifetime membership uh, that you can take. So you can choose either of those options. 
to uh, go for this course. This course should be available to you this week uh, onwards, right? I'm almost done. I've uploaded the videos. I just have to create the quizzes um, and then it should be live uh, most likely, you know, uh, even tonight or sub like something like tomorrow, it should be, it could be there, right? So I'm just uploading it to the course. So if on the portal, it would be available by our uh, day after tomorrow, right? It's there. Uh, I just have to put all the content together and uh, then just, you know, uh, push the live but, uh, publish button. That's all, right? But the content wise, it's almost everything is there. Maybe barring an introductory video, which I will record uh, tomorrow. So that's the announcement from my side uh, on Argo Bootcamp. I'm also starting to uh, refresh the existing content. For example, the Cloud Bootcamp that we have right now, AWS and Azure, I'll start refreshing that content followed by Kubernetes and rest of the content as well. All right, so that's happening right now. And this is a course which is gonna be quite interesting for everyone who uh, is using Kubernetes and thinking of setting up a CI CD on top of that. All right, so any other questions from anyone uh, right now? Cool, so we'll close the session in that case. If you want to stay on and uh, ask me anything, if you have any further questions, feel free to stay stay back as well. But otherwise we Gaurav, are done with the session here. Gaurav, okay. quick question, this is Pradeep. Yes, Pradeep, go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at the dashboard uh, on the portal. Uh, I'm not able to make it as a mark complete for this cloud ops cohort. Um, then mm -hmm. it is not letting me even look at that. Uh, the document it says so go back and complete the uh vpc and oh, network. okay i will change that configuration i think that's happening because uh there is a def by default there is a uh sequencing steps it just expects you to complete everything in the yeah I, yeah i finished the watching that video then like uh trying to press the mark complete button it is not letting me so i, I will fix that that should be uh that should be quite quick in fact, yeah. that's just a configuration, I think, that I'll have to change where I will have to say, uh, don't, you know, kind of uh, uh, enforce that sequence. So I'll just change that co configuration and uh, that should be it, right? So that I'll take care of, okay? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this linear free form, this is the configuration I have to change. Um, yeah, that's it. So I think that should, uh, that should, that should be it for that. Yeah, thank you. That's all I noticed. Looks good. No problems. All right, cool. Uh, anything else, folks? All right. We are done for this uh, this session. Uh, we'll come back next Monday and uh, build a little more about, uh, do some more advanced things with this use case. Take it to the next uh, step. Uh, and step by step, iteration by iteration, will build the entire use case on uh, AWS Cloud with Linux networking and stuff like that. All right, so thank you, and I'll see you next week uh, with the next session. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, bye. Thank you.